Okay, next is a feature session from uh, the Cosmetics Cluster UK, um, and it's going to be led by Kirsty Mawini. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for missing on your lunch. Um, you can always get it after this session if you haven't had it before. My name is Kirsty, and I'm director of Cosmetics Cluster UK. If you're thinking, wow, what is a cluster? Why don't you come over to stand M15 after this session and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, today's title is How on Earth Do You Get from Source to Bottle? So it's all about the cosmetic sector and the value chain. The global cosmetics market is expected to be worth $48 billion by 2025. Here, we place a spotlight on the ingredients from the bioeconomy, highlighting new processes, sources, and alternative forms um, from the chemical industry. Upcycling, if we haven't heard that word a lot um, recently, is used in other industries. Waste streams is a key trend. So incorporating green chemistry principles with the 21st century innovation through biotechnology processes such as fermentation is what we're going to be discussing today. We're also seeing a great transformation of the ingredient supply chain in the cosmetic sector. Often bio-based functional ingredients can outperform their fossil-based counterparts. I know some of our speakers are going to share a little bit about that as well as being kinder to the environment, and they meet market claims such as vegan and natural. So we have many startups and innovators and potentially new suppliers that are unfamiliar with this industry, what it needs are, and how to enter it viably. CCUK, Cosmetics Cluster UK, acts as a bridge between the bioeconomy and the cosmetic industry, bringing together experts from the cosmetic field to share their experience and expertise to help knowledge flow along the value chain. So without further ado, I'm going to explain how we're running this session. We've got two parts to this session. Session one is a masterclass, and I have two fabulous speakers I will mention in a moment. And then session two is a case study session and panel discussion. So the masterclass, we have Dr. Judy Brailing of Pet Tech Associates, and she's going to be discussing can certification standards help define natural and sustainable for the cosmetic formulator. And Judy is here um, on my left. And we've got um, Lawrence Clark from Holly Firm. He's next to Judy. He's going to be talking about the challenges of sustainable product development and how to overcome them. And as I've mentioned, we've got session two, part two, which is the case studies. So over here on my right, I have Richard Locke of Holly Firm. He's the managing director, and he's going to talk all about scale up. Next to Richard is Rachel Davidson of Behrens, and she's going to talk cream from the crop, ingredients crossing the boundaries from food and other divisions into cosmetics. Next to um, Rachel is Narinda Baines, and he's going to be talking about developing a sustainable bio-based ingredient for cosmetic products. And Narinda is from a company called iNuvo. And finally, but definitely not least, is a representative from CPI, Melanie Gear, and she's going to be talking about innovative projects with CPI. So, without further ado, let me bring up Judy, and each speaker will come up in according to how I've just announced them. To cut down on time, we're going to run through all the speakers' sessions, and then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. Fingers crossed we don't run over. Thank you, Kirsty, for the introduction. So, being first speaker, you get to work out how this works, but I'm told, yeah, it's very simple to, uh, to operate the slides. So I'm going to talk to you about can certification standards help to define what a natural or sustainable um, product is um, in terms of a cosmetic formulator, which is what I am. So, first of all, a few definitions. Um, there actually is no legal definition of a natural cosmetic. 
Um, but of course, these certification standards that I'm going to mention uh, shortly do help uh, because they publish detailed criteria. So you at least have something to go by. There is an ISO standard, the ISO 16128, which does go part way to help. Uh, but actually, there's no protection of natural and organic and similar terms um, around the world. So uh, there is a little bit in, in uh, California around organic. But to be honest, in cosmetics, there, there really is very little to, uh, to give you any legal framework. There is, however, a lot of greenwashing around sustainability. And I think it's true to say that many, many consumers these days want to know more about how products are made. What do they contain? What's, what sort of uh, container is the product in? And something about the life cycle of products. So um, there's certainly a lot of interest in this area. So um, the ingredients that go into natural cosmetics, which is often where you're starting when you're, you're formulating, deciding on them. And the various standards all do have a, a, a kind of common ground, a sort of ethos, um, and it's around no petroleum-derived products, no synthetic fragrances and colours. Uh, they tend not to allow things like silicon oils and derivatives. They, they tend not to like genetic modification of ingredients. Um, also, irradiation tends to be uh, out of the picture as well. And that's often, uh, you know, maybe used in botanical ingredients or even end products. Um, and so really only natural, naturally derived, um, they're called various things, also called derived natural, chemically modified, but basically natural origin ingredients. And certain things that are nature identical. So in particular in, in uh, cosmetics, some of the, uh, the preservatives are actually kind of identical to what you can find in nature but they're they actually made synthetically. These can tend to be the things that you use in, the, in a natural formulation. A few words on the ISO standard. I'm not going to, to bore you to death with, uh, with lots of information, but just to say that this exists. It gives you guidelines for, uh, for um, the ingredients and uh, something around the products, and it's divided into part one and part two. So part one, which came out first, defines it, the ingredients that can be natural or organic. Um, and then part two goes more into the criteria for these ingredients and the end products. And that came uh, as about 18 months after the first part. It took a lot of work over many years to come up with this ISO standard. So a few words about part two. So this gives you a framework to determine the natural, the natural origin, the organic and the organic origin content of products based on the ingredients that you have in there. But what it does stop short of doing is defining what a minimum percentage of these natural origin ingredients should be in the end product. So it kind of doesn't really finish off the whole um, process by, by saying you've got to have 50%, 70%, 80%, whatever. Um, so it's useful for ingredient businesses, um, pro but less so for the formulator or for marketing purposes. So what happens when you, uh, you formulate a product? What's the process if you're trying to do something more natural? You need to obviously be very careful about your formulation spe specifications and the direction early on in the process. Know where you're going is always helpful. Um, you need to define what your benchmark products are. Are there things on the market that, that work really well that you want to, to do something similar to? Um, but are, are those actually natural or organic? Um, if they're not, if they're a, a, what I would call a more conventional product, um, maybe they contain ingredients, certain synthetics, that are quite hard to mimic. Um, things like silicones and acrylic copolymers. Um, and also, will the product need to be coloured or fragranced? That's very important. Doing that naturally is more difficult. Um, and also, do you want to look at the whole uh, sustainability angle in terms of, do you want to cold process the product or minimise water usage? 
And of course, very important these days, what's it going to be packaged in? So the challenges for the formulator are selecting the, the functional ingredients. They kind of form the chassis of the formulation. Um, and so getting those right is really, uh, really um, important. And if you're going to come up with something that truly is going to be um, a natural or green product, then you need to get those uh, in, a, in a natural form. But if it's something grown agriculturally, that, that supply chain may not be always uh, guaranteed. Um, and also a, a shout out for small brands that we tend to call indie brands in the industry. Minimum order quantities can be a, a big problem for small companies who don't want to buy several tons of an ingredient. But you still need to do all the normal things you do in cosmetics, evaluate product stability, color, odor, safety, and also look at the cost implications. And of course, energy usage these days is very important in the production process, the packaging, the carbon dioxide and water fit footprints. They're all things you need, need to take into account in terms of sustainability. I'm sure you all know what sustainability is about several pillars around social, environmental, economic aspects. Um, and that's really, you need to look at the whole production chain of a product to ensure an overall positive image. So your strategy when you start to formulate, um, and, and as a brand as well, is to, to say what, which of these things are most important to me. Are there certain ethical issues, certain sustainability issues that are more important than others? Can I build these all in from day one? Quite hard if you're a startup business. So does a certification or accreditation help? Um, and can you substantiate those claims? Are the claims meaningful and honest? Um, and what's it all going to cost? All of these things, getting a certification, for example, cost time and money. So industries come up with some interesting uh, things that, that uh, you know, ingredients um, that they can, uh, can help with this. So using biotechnology, microalgae, green extraction technologies, upcycling waste from the food industry, green chemistry, all of those things uh, these days are important. And traceability is now key. I'm going to skip over this one because I'm going to go over time. So I'm going to come to some final thoughts. So natural organic products resonate with consumers and are obviously set to grow strongly. Renewability is a great aim, but not at any cost. Um, natural formulations must work still and perform a real function um, and be a pleasure to use. And sustainability, of course, is a journey, not a destination. So in the last few seconds, I'm just going to mention we have a big event going on in London in September 19th to the 22nd. It's a congress on cosmetic science. Um, the subtitle is where beauty, science and innovation meet. Um, and again, you can look at the, uh, the full presentation. There's lots going on with podium presentations, educational workshops and so on. It's hosted by the Society of Cosmetic Scientists UK and Ireland, but to a global audience. It's going to be in Westminster, um, and actually the early bird registration is still open, so book now. Um, you will save money over the standard fee. So that's my last slide. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Lawrence Clark of Holly Firm, um, and I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the challenges of uh, sustainable product development. So first of all, most important thing you need to do is decide what product it is that you want to make. Might sound like a silly question, but what claims do you want to make? Um, as has been touched on before, what products do you want to be similar to? Um, in a performance standpoint, visual, and then also, what do you want to change from a sustainability point of view? Um, what's most important to you as a formulator and a brand? 
And then also, the probably most important thing, what does your consumer want to actually buy? So what does your consumer want? We can guide the consumer. It's really important to guide the consumer. They don't always know what they want to buy. We can guide them with um, claims and marketing, branding, uh, following market trends, as well as creating new market trends. Um, different consumers are gonna really want different things. And you need to decide before you make your new product which consumer you're making it for. So consider your brand, where you position yourself in the market, and what your consumer profile is. Um, obviously things to consider are the sensorials of your product, what it looks like, what it feels like, smells like. Um, some of the application properties like foaming, the performance, cleaning performance, and of course price. There's plenty of consumers that want to buy natural, uh, natural products, want to make a difference in, and put their money kind of where their mouth and uh, ideologies are in terms of buying sustainable products. And these consumers might be willing to spend a touch more money. They might also expect a different looking and feeling product. So for example, the color might not be luminous yellow or crystal clear. Um, the, the differences in these um, products, like natural products compared to traditional products, is not necessarily negative when you um, consider the opinions of these consumers that want a proper natural product. But on the other hand, there's plenty of consumers that still want what they're used to. They're not going to accept any change in terms of performance, in terms of how it smells, how it looks. Um, and that set of consumers that isn't going to accept any change is probably the people that you're catering for if you're in a larger company with well-established brands and your brand means everything and you can't risk making a bad product. And for these consumers, making a 100% natural product is going to be a big challenge and it's one that the industry definitely needs to step up to. Um, but yeah, it's not... Um, it's no trivial thing um, so to begin the journey for this set of consumers you might want to go partially natural to begin with introduce them to it over years uh, get them used to the difference in, um, in in sensorials and things and then really bring that consumer on the journey over a period of years and then compared to the other consumer which wants natural now and is willing to compromise for it in terms of what the product looks like, they want something different. Uh, maybe that's more suited to a smaller smaller brand, as has been mentioned, maybe an indie brand. Um, there's a lot of local success catering for this consumer that wants um, a true natural product. Um, so once you've decided what product you want to make and who you're making it for, you need to find some raw materials and finding natural raw materials is not uh, easy necessarily. There's um, some out there, but there needs to be more. Um, at Holly Firm, we're bringing biosurfactants to market, um, but we really welcome competition. We want more people to bring more natural materials to the market uh, to help formulators to make um, sustainable products. Um, so when you're assessing your raw materials, you need to be able to make the claims that you've um, that you've um, selected that you want to make. You want to find raw materials with the benefits that you want to include in your products and align with established accreditations. And there's lots of those to pick from. Uh, do you want your product to be vegan, um, palm free, or RSPO palm um, sourced, cruelty free, eco label? There's loads and loads of accreditations that you can pick from. So, again, you need to think about these accreditations before you choose your raw materials. Uh, once you've identified raw materials from that aspect you need to make sure they're truly sustainable and in order to do that you need to understand the supply chain and guarantee that you can actually access the material so ideally you'd want more than one supplier again in true natural materials um, not necessarily going to be possible but we need to encourage people to manufacture more so um, 
pester your suppliers for uh, natural raw materials, please. Um, there is a lot of momentum in the market at the moment, bringing natural raw materials through, and the big companies are putting their um, their mouths in this space. I'm not sure about their money just yet, but a lot of them have uh, have promised to go um, along this journey with us. So there is a lot of momentum in the market with things like biosurfactants, green solvents, um, recycled packaging, and biodegradable packaging. There's things like new plastic taxes coming into play and traditional materials will get regulated out over the coming years, decades. Um, so yeah, as I say, big companies are uh, putting momentum behind this uh, movement of raw materials. But what's also really important is, as I've been mentioned, to avoid greenwashing. So you need to understand where your raw materials come from. Not all bio-based materials are sustainable. Um, palm deforestation is not necessarily a positive thing so replacing materials with um, with bio-based uh, materials made from palm can lead to negative um, consequences for the globe um, palm forests often grow on peatland so by deforesting that and um, exposing the peatland to burning and oxidation releases a shed load of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that had been locked away for a long time. So it's a similar thing to taking oil out of the ground. So you do want to avoid um, a supply chain like that. You need to really make sure you understand where your products are coming from and the, um, the impact that that supply chain, supply chain is having. Um, from the biosurfactant side of things, um, which is where Holyfirm operate, a traditional surfactant supply chain either starts with fossil fuels or tropical oils, massive global um, transport and supply, and then a chemical synthesis step. So people need to get inventive to make new raw materials that don't follow um, such kind of a damaging supply chain. There are some of them out there. Holyfirm try to provide some, um, but we do need to get creative with our um, supplying and formulations as well. So now once you've identified your raw materials and what product you want to make, um, you need to then develop them. And that's a challenge as well. If you want to make a fully natural product, it's not uh, necessarily an easy thing to formulate a fully natural product because the raw materials are often new um, and formulators don't necessarily already have the knowledge and the industry might not have the knowledge to make the product you want to make. Um, so you need to get creative. But there are benefits that some of these raw materials have that we've not had in the industry before. Um, true natural molecules, are they exist in nature and they tend not to just have one function. So over the coming years, formulators need to understand and figure out the synergies and the added benefits that a lot of these natural raw materials can give your products. Um, often the person that knows best how to use the natural materials is the supplier. Um, so ask them questions, um, ask for their um, inspiration, their ideas, combinations of materials. They will have played with the material more than you have and hopefully you can take that existing knowledge and expand it and then eventually the formulators will know more than the suppliers about how to use the materials. But you really need to try and mine that information. If you don't know much already, mine it from the supplier and really ask what they might do if they were making a product that you're trying to make. So in summary, you need to decide what product you want to make. You need to decide what your consumer is going to buy. Understand the impact of different raw materials. Identify su suitable raw materials that you can actually have access to and align with your, um, your message. Guarantee supply of those raw materials and then begin your de development journey. Um, but, so good luck on that. <laughs>